Um, well, yeah, I'm uh, Brahim Awaba, uh, an Algerian academic, and um, an Algerian academic and an aspiring uh, writer. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, Alwan for the Arts for hosting this event and um, creating the space for this form of uh, artistic expression and uh, and uh, production. Uh, one that is predicated on on the aim of decolonization, of uh, liberation and, uh, and emancipation to be shown here and to be discussed. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank Alauda New York for, uh, for organizing the event and um, Lemmy Zdik in particular for her kind invitation. And I'd like to salute you uh, on the incredible work that the organization has been involved in, in carrying out. Um, last but not least, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight uh, and sharing these moments with us. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, Algeria, the Algerian experience, and try and tease out points of, of comparison um, and or uh, lessons to be learned. Uh, sadly, uh, history does repeat itself. Um, and uh, and uh, watching the movie has really sort of um, brought up uh, sort of um, oral memories that are that I heard growing up. Um, so let me just say a few things that as well for a few minutes on on what the movie has done. Uh, it has really and bef before I do that, also I want to point out that uh, I thought the comparison is a fitting one, uh, precisely because Algeria was also a, a settler colonial uh, uh, colony, um, a settler colony. So, and uh, settler colonialism is a particular type of colonialism, unlike other forms uh, that are sort of motivated by, uh, by uh, uh, resources, uh, access to resources, settler colonial, in, in, in the case of settler colonialism, the key resource is land. So it is really the, the the objective of it is to depopulate uh, entire areas and uh, and hand over and turn over those lands to settler populations, um, and uh, at the expense of of the of the indigenous populations. Um, and this, the historian Patrick Wolf says that about settler colonialism being that it destroys to replace. That's that's sort of the the motto of, uh, of settler colonialism. And the movie has done a good job in in bringing those those themes out. Um, uh, it has shown sort of the the, the hierarchical uh, racial hierarchical uh, nature of the of the uh, of the um, colonial context. Where settlers are, are uh, or Zionists are uh, um, morally and racially superior to uh, to the indigenous population, it is a project again that is based on dis dispossessing the, the the indigenous populations of their lands, of their resources, of their um, time and labor, um, and quite simply of their humanity. Um, and justifications that we've seen in in the movie are national security, so the Ministry of Defense or the, uh, the, uh, the colonial state grants itself the right to, to, uh, to seize any land that it deems to be vital for its national security. That's one of the discourses that are used as justifications. Another one is, um, is the discourse of, of uh, idleness, of inactivity or of inefficiency and, uh, and, uh, um, and the utilization of the land. Uh, and and that sort of brings up, it, it harks back to those uh, Orientalist tropes that uh, these indigenous peoples are, are backward. They are they are unable to uh, to work the land at an optimal level. Uh, they lack the, the know-how, uh, the technological wherewithal uh, needed for a modern um, modern agriculture. Um, so. So you see, with the, with that, uh, as Fanon has said, the colonized world is really a world that is divided into two. Um, on on uh, and and the 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 border, the uh, the delimitation is is represented by the uh, police stations, by the 
uh, military barracks, by, 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 by walls and barbed wire and, and checkpoints. Uh, where on the one, on the, on the one side, are, uh, the, the, the first side is inhabited by, uh, by those who are deemed to be deserving of life, of, uh, of security, of comfort, and those are the, the, the settler population. And the other side is reserved to uh, the indigenous populations who are, who are generally deemed to be a problem, a, uh, a threat, uh, and an inconvenience that needs to be removed uh, to clear the area for, uh, for settler um, populations. So what I found amazing about this movie is uh, the way it has really weaved uh, the, uh, the, the, the issues that were, um, that seemed to be important at the time and, and that I, was seen through the protagonists. You have the colonial state uh, that, that is experienced by Palestinians uh, only through its repressive apparatuses. So the, the only contact they had with the colonial state was the soldier, was the uh, military headquarters, uh, and its judi uh, judiciary also through the, the, uh, the court orders uh, or uh, notifying someone like Masoud that his, his land has been uh, seized. Those are the only contacts that they have with those, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, you know, with the colonial state. The second is a national or indigenous bourgeoisie. Um, uh, that is, to a certain extent, some landowners, business owners, like the uh, Abu Ahmed, the uh, coffee shop owner, uh, the managers, uh, and rural and urban elites and notables, who, uh, it's a class that, uh, to borrow Malcolm X's uh, phrase, are the house Negroes. Uh, they, are, they are benefiting, they are very much, they have a vested interest in the colonial system, they are benefiting through exploiting their compatriots, uh, the landowners through uh, through cheap uh, cheap labor. Uh, the managers are getting a cut or a commission on on the hourly rates of the workers. Uh, the, co the the coffee shop is selling argilas and uh, and tea. Uh, the rent seeker who's uh, who's uh, who's uh, you know using the USAID flour uh, and selling it in fact uh, to uh, to people. So, uh, and last but not least, most importantly, are the masses, uh, and, and they are in sort of organic leaders, uh, like Al -Asi, Muhammad Al-Asi and uh, Mahmoud uh, Masarwa, um, who showed, really demonstrated that, the, the, that they had a struggle, uh, you know, a multi-dimensional struggle. They were not only struggling sort of vertically uh, against an external uh, oppressor, uh, a struggle that was informed by their, you know, that showed uh, a national consciousness underpinned by Arab nationalism, but they were all, they had also a, a struggle that was more horizontal uh, against an internal enemy uh, that they saw, that, and that is informed by, by a class consciousness uh, against this indigen indigenous bourgeoisie that was exploiting them. Uh, and that was represented in their uh, in their um, sort of uh, attempts at unionizing and bettering the uh, the uh, the working conditions and um, and uh, rates for, for for workers. So the Algerian case here comes comes to mind. I, mean, I yeah to, to talk about Algerian you know the Algerian colonial era, which was 132 years in the space of 10 minutes. I think uh, is uh, quite impossible, but I could uh, try to uh, to uh, to summarize um, and and see uh, uh, you know the, what was what was um, similar or comparable. Um, again, uh, the the comparison is 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 uh, fitting in the sense that this was a, a settler colony that the French in the uh, Algeria, uh, well, invaded Algeria in uh, 1830, and um, for the few, the first few decades, they adopted a, a policy of scorched earth. Uh, so they've bur burned and raised everything uh, in, during the, uh, the conquest, quite simply to clear the space for, for a settler population to take over. Um, so just to represent the zeitgeist of the time, um, I've, I've taken down a couple of, of, uh, of quotes 
Um, like in 1841, uh, General Bugo, who was the resident general uh, in, in Algeria, sent in an email letter that he sent to Emir Abdel Qadr, one of the leaders of the, uh, the resistance at the time, uh, said, I will enter into your mountains, I will burn your villages and your harvests, I will cut down your fruit trees. That may sound very familiar uh, to you. Uh, in the next, the following year, a French uh, officer, uh, Saint Arnaud, writes that in April, in Cherchel, Tipaza, and Khmis Meliana, these are three Algerian towns, uh, we ravaged, burned, and destroyed everything on our, uh, on our way. Another officer, Lucien de, de Montignac, uh, in a letter to his, uh, to his family in 19, uh, 1842, he says, je je coupe des So when I get bored, I cut heads, not artificial heads, but people's heads. And he's telling, you know, re relating to his family, what uh, his daily life, what he does. Uh, and these sort of th three examples I just put out there for us to, to understand the uh, sort of, the, they, they summarize the violence uh, to which the indigenous or the Alger Algerians were uh, subjected to at the, hand, uh, at the hands of their uh, colonial oppressors. So, this this manichaeism of the of the of the, uh, the colonial world really reaches a logical uh, conclusion by dehumanizing the colonial subject. That's the bottom line. It dehumanizes the colonial subject. It's 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 a kind of power that is about exacting by uh, by ta uh, taking away taking away one's land, taking away one's freedom, taking away uh, through taxes, taking and ultimately taking away one's life. Uh, that's the type of power uh, that the colonial project brings uh, brings with it. And again, the the objective here is of these uh, atrocities are are is to terrorize and to to force people to to leave to clear the space uh, for for. Uh, for the uh, settler uh, colonialist, and uh, so, and in the case of Algeria, this type of, of, of uh, deracination also was a form of emptying Algeria of its inhabitants, and sort of a, a new take on the idea that the Algerian nation had never existed before. That was very important to the French uh, colonial administration, and we can see parallels. With the with the mantra of the, a land without people for people without land, that's not new. That was used before, uh, denying or decimating uh, a, a nation's identity is one way of dominating it. So, those 132 years. Let me just very briefly. Maybe we can sort of break them into three. Uh, three phases of resistance to, uh, to, uh, to the French. The first phase, the first 50, 45 years, um, were marked by, by armed uh, insurrections. Uh, one of the first was led by Amir Abdel Qadr. Uh, there was uh, in, the, in, the, in the west, in the center of Algeria, there was the, uh, the insurrection of the Lalla Fatma and Sumer. Uh, she led a, uh, a second insurrection against, uh, against the French. Uh, there was uh, the, the insurrection of Bouamama and uh, Sheikh Mokrani, uh, and by the late 19th century, those were crushed, and Algeria was pacified, i.e., uh, decimated. Uh, so, for the next five decades, the, um, with the birth of the nationalist movement, um, it was mainly what we saw was 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 a, a politics of recognition. Uh, it was a, a more liberal sort of approach to asking for uh, for integration, asking for uh, for equal rights, uh, asking for uh, for uh, some you know um, local representatives and assemblies to be elected locally and so on. Um, and that maybe we may want to think about that in the in the context of Oslo. When I think about it, for for some of us or who think uh, or who are su uh, supporters of a one one uh, uh, a one state solution, what that may might look like, um, but uh, for 50 years nothing has changed. No reforms, meaningful reforms, had taken place. Uh, the, th the third phase was uh, but, uh, started around the, the time of World War Two. 
And uh, in 1944, uh, the French president, de Gaulle, uh, ma made a speech in Brazzaville, or today's Congo, um, where the, the French were pretty much losing in uh, World War II. It was occupied fr uh, France by the, by the Nazis. And uh, the French sort of political class realized that that uh, that uh, for France to re to remain a, uh, a, a world power, it needed to change. Um, that is to change everything so that nothing changes. Really, uh, that was the sort of the the spirit of the of the time, um, and that gave s uh, some in the nationalist movement some hope uh, that uh, that you know things would change and. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Algerians were forcibly conscripted to fight in the front lines uh, against um, against the, the Nazis and the fascists. So, just to, as a side note, uh, it was never the French who liberated France. It was it was Africans. It was Algerians. It was Moroccans. It was Senegalese. Those are the uh, in the same way that, that uh, the British army was mainly uh, people from uh, India or Pakistan and elsewhere from the colonies. Um, but in, 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 uh, in, in, 40, in 1945, 8th of May uh, 1945, where the world, or let's say the Western world, was celebrating the defeat of, of Nazism uh, with parties in Paris and London and New York, uh, there was a demonstration in the, uh, the city of Satif in Algeria, and um, it was met with brutal, uh, brutal force, uh, which turned into a real intifada and spread to other uh, to other cities. Uh, and in the in that insurrection, within the space of two weeks, uh, the um, the French army had killed forty five thousand Algerians in in the space of two weeks, uh, and that's the and that was not. Just in Algeria, there was the same in Mozambique. There was the same in Indochina. The massacres that had taken place around uh, around that. Those th that demonstration was asking for the release of the nationalist uh, leaders and also for self determination. So, uh, with this, a month later, in June '45, the surviving soldiers were coming back. The soldiers who were liberating France were coming back to find that their families had been massacred by the same country that they were liberating, uh, that their parents were massacred, that their children were no longer there. Um, and this Katib Yassin, an Algerian poet, talking about this, uh, this episode, he says, it was at Sitif that my sense of humanity was affronted for the first time by the most atrocious sights. I was 16 years, uh, years old. The shock which I felt at the pitiless butchery that caused the deaths of thousands of Muslims, I have never forgotten. From that moment, my nationalism took definite form. So this is a really t uh, a turning point for uh, the, the nationalist movement uh, then. Uh, uh, and there was a split in the, the nationalist m movement, but the majority had realized that the co colonialism never gives anything for nothing. One. Two, change is not about uh, reform, it's not about uh, improvement, um, it's not about, you know, a few things here and there, it's nothing less than revolution, a total reversal of the status quo uh, and, and a the creation of a situation where the last shall be first. That's that's total liberation. There is no no more talking uh, about uh, you know about reform. No more talking about negotiations. And uh, this is an untenable uh, situation. The dehumanization has has led has led the, the Algerians at the at the time to realize that it is only through liberation, it is only through resistance, it is only through struggle that their selves are reconstructed. That new men, you, you're, not, you're, not, you're not a human if you're under the, 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 the colonial yoke. Um, so what ensued is, uh, and that the, 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 the Algerian revolution between 50, 50, 54 and 60, uh, 62, uh, and just in those 
few years, uh, 1.5 million Algerians lo lost their, uh, their lives, um, and anywhere between uh, 5 and 6 million were displaced. Uh, and that's, we're talking about, you know, uh, a population of 8 million at uh, the point of uh, independence. So maybe a fifth uh, were lost their lives and over two-thirds were, uh, were displaced. So at this point, I think one of the, one of the uh, what, what, what worked uh, in that is, is the move, I think, from, from a more reformist, uh, politics of recognition to a revolutionary moment. Uh, there was an acute awareness of of uh, of the importance of of transnational solidarities. Uh, Algerians also they were very present. The the nationalist movement they were very present at the Bangdong uh, conference, uh, which was mentioned uh, mentioned here. Uh, developing uh, developing links to nationalist movements in Tunisia and Morocco, uh, very close relations to Jamal Abdel Nasser and, and Egypt, uh, who were of tremendous help. Um, but they also knew that this decolonization is a is, is a, a global struggle. That you struggle in uh, in in Cuba. That you struggle in in Angola, in, in Mozambique, in in. Uh, um, in Guinea-Bissau uh, and in Vietnam at the same time, those struggles go hand in hand, uh, and that that policy was later on sort of shown in the, the nascent states foreign policy, um, where uh, Amil Kar Cabral uh, on on uh, in 69 um, on on sort of the margins of the. Uh, the first and last, sadly, the last Pan-African uh, festival. Uh, he said to 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 to, uh, to reporters that take your pens and note down that the Muslims make their pilgrimage to to Mecca, and uh, the Catholics to Rome, and the revolutionaries to Algiers, where the Black Panthers were given, a, um, the, you know, their first international uh, embassy, if you like, just opposite the street from the, the American embassy, where the PLO had its, its first um, office also, Arafat, on the 5th of July, was in, in Algiers, celebrating, celebrating uh, with the Algerians the, on the day of, uh, of independence, and he was very conscious in, in um, modeling the, uh, the, the PLO on on uh, on the same line or similar lines as the FLN. So those connections between various uh, movements uh, that are struggling for against a, a global system that oppresses the majority of humanity uh, for the benefit of the few cannot be led locally. It had to be led on a global scale. Um, so. And just to end on a Fanonian uh, uh, note also, that what, what do we do uh, uh, for us here? And, uh, and I think I, I can leave the substance of that to, to the discussion, but I think Fanon has put it quite, quite nicely that uh, each generation uh, must, out of relative obscurity, um, realize its mission, either fulfill it or betray it. Um, and in our generation, I think we need to reflect on that statement um, and decide how to move forward. So I think I'll leave it at that. And yeah. You made a great point, and, and that's why we wanted to, to have this second in our series on Zionist colonizing violence be about Algeria because history does repeat itself but it's not some kind of passive act but this is a very active um, act and way to be um, and, and it's important that, that we look at what succeeded um, and what didn't succeed actually um, and how things came to be because Algeria was a really critical moment internationally as you said and definitely a critical moment in the U.S. and in the U.S. perception um, and I don't mean the U.S. government. <laughs> I mean in, in, in the people's perception of not just Algeria, but really the Arab people in general. And we can liken it a little bit to the way that we saw this kind of reclamation of dignity 
by Arabs in the region at the initiation of what was called the Arab Spring, right? That somehow this kind of taking back by, by all of these various means is very empowering. And so, you know, but we look at the flip side, right? So France was the colonial crossroads of, of the world at the time that it was colonizing Africa. It was the colonial crossroads of the region, and it exported all of its tactics and it coordinated internationally to colonize and to help other forces colonize. And now it can be said that Israel is the colonial crossroads of the world, or right? at least the colonial crossroads of the region, right? Exporting its, making Palestine its testing ground and exporting all of these lessons and all of this technology and all of these weapons to the rest of the world and even to us here in the United States. From Standing Rock to Baltimore to the streets of New York and San Francisco, Israel is exporting these policies to the wall on the Mexican border. So this is the reality that we're, we're working with and it's important that we keep thinking about it. They call, they call the Zionist colonizing entity the bastion of democracy in the Middle East. No, it's the bastion of Zionist colonialism in the Middle East. It's the bastion of Zionist colonizing violence. It is the bastion of colonization in the Middle East. And everything that we're seeing stems from this bastion called the Zionist entity. Um, the problem, however, has been that since Oslo um, and since quote unquote negotiations, right, and that's one of the tools of the colonizer is to enter into negotiations, the middle phase um, in the Algerian liberation movement was negotiations with the colonizer, right, which ultimately were, were useless because the only thing that the negotiations did was sanctify the power and the violence of the colonizer and, you know, make impotent the colonized, right, by making them rely on these other mechanisms that are supposed to somehow diffuse um, that violence, right, without ever removing it, just diffusing it, and that's what Oslo did. Oslo complicated and it diffused that violence and gave it different names, right? It became a policy, it became a military regulation, it became a law. That was the point of Oslo. It made it terms, right? And it turned it into a human rights issue versus an issue of violence being inflicted on an unarmed, unarmed native indigenous Palestinian population, right? And, and this sanctifying of Zionist violence pretty much left the Palestinians almost incapable or with very little ways of protecting themselves physically. So by centralizing, and this is really the heart of the series of actions that we have, a uh, series of events in the series, is centralizing Zionist violence, right? And Zionist colonizing violence and the redemptive power of Palestinian resistance, not just in these, you know, ideological or, you know, in abstract ways, but really in practical ways. What does it mean to, to, uh, to redeem Palestinians? What does it mean to resist? Um, and, and that begins with the beginning of the sentence has to be, the beginning of the phrase has to be, the beginning of the argument always has to be that first came and what is what we are experiencing, not just first came, what is now is Zionist violence. And we have to be able to identify it. And I think we need to take a step back and not fall into any of the trap of human rights issues and this balancing act between you know this UN uh, provision and and the terms of Oslo and disrobe it, right? Unmask. One of the powers that the Zionists have is that they operate under this cloak of civilization, right? Which are these really horrific and violent agreements, right? They, they act under this cloak of anonymity and we have to disrobe them individually and collectively and unmask all of these quote unquote policies for what they are, which means that we re-identify, we rename things for what they are. Settlements are violent. The settler population that is being brought in is a weaponized, violent population. They are trained and they are supported and with them comes violent soldiers that are militarily equipped, right? Labor relations between Palestinians and Zionists are reinforced by violence. The inability of Palestinians to return to their homes, still remaining the largest 
refugee population in the world and the oldest refugee population in, in the world, they're prevented from returning only because of violence, right? I'm not saying that you don't resort to these other international laws to further the argument, but the initiation and the center has to be that the issue is Zionist colonizing violence. That's why there are Palestinian refugees. Our culture, the way that we interact with each other, which Brahim talked upon, it touched upon briefly, has been shaped by Zionist violence, how we perceive each other, our human relationships, our intimate relationships have all been shaped by Zionist violence, right? And this is not just some theoretical exercise, this is the reality. And the, you know, what, what's mind boggling is that it's only gotten worse, right? It's not that, you know, 1948, 13,000 Palestinians and two thirds of the Palestinian population was exiled, but it's gotten ex exponentially worse, right? So you know now we see now now we see Palestinians being hunted globally, right? They're massacred in the refugee camps across the world. They're hunted and targeted here in the United States. We see the the killings of Palestinians. You know, before the Israelis used to try to hide the way that they killed Palestinians, right? They were you know they're they're still a little bit worried about it now. They take photos. They make a theater of killing Palestinians. It's a show. I mean, they actually perform this, right? They'll kill the Palestinian, and then the man will go get a cup of coffee and take a photograph of, of himself with the murdered Palestinian. There's a theater around killing Palestinians. And this is meant to send a message not only to the community, right, to the town people to terrorize them, but it's meant to send a message internationally to further dehumanize, to further reinforce the violent dynamics that keep Palestinians as colonial subjects, right? Um, you know, the, the increased repression, the anti-BDS legislation, and BDS is very important, and, and we'll talk about ways of pivoting, right, to really empower um, work around this, but maybe think about it in a different way and to escalate it in a different way, right? But the anti-BDS work, you know, is really anti, the anti-BDS legislation is anti-Palestinian legislation. That's what it is, and that's what it has to be seen for, and that's what it's got to be called. And it's an extension of the same violence that hunts Palestinians globally. You know, and Oslo was critical to this phase, the middle phase. That's the, the phase that we were in, and we're coming out of it. And so it's a critical time for us to be talking about how, what resistance looks like and how we become an extension of that resistance here in the U.S. in what, you know, a friend of mine calls, in a way that are as legal as possible, right? Um, but what did we have before Oslo, right? We had a united national body, right? We had means of resistance, that, and we had a resistance that existed internationally, not just in Palestine, that connected Palestinians from the refugee camps to Gaza, to the West Bank, to the 1948 territories, to Lebanon, to the U.S., we were connected globally, and there was a resistance that was supported, and it was a resistance that was respected, internationally respected, even though it was an armed resistance. And I mean, what did we have post Oslo? Right? We have 85% of the Palestinian economy pillaged. Right? The Zionists have stolen 85% of Palestinian economy and production. Right? A, a, a separation barrier that, that's built that isn't even actually, it's not built. It's only two thirds of the way built because the point is that it takes as much as they can get away with. Increasing amounts of settlements, a divided national body, divided politically and divided geographically, unable to access each other, right? Politically, I mean, that's, you know, a whole, a whole other uh, can of worms. I lost my page and my train of thought. Um, and instead of relying on resistance, which largely has been criminalized in the past 30, 40 years, right? Most of the NGOs and most of the countries giving aid will not give aid to the, the primary Palestinian groups who engage in self-defense, that's what resistance is, in self-defense against Zionist colonizing violence. And instead, they're told that they need to wait for Mahsoum Watch and Beit Salem and BDS and all of these other people to indirectly pressure, right? And to monitor, monitor, <laughs> and report Zionist violence. This is the extent of international support we really get for the resistance. It, this is excluding, you know, we won't talk about, let, let's not, considering what's happened, let's not talk about the very rare exception, right? This is what, and so we're told again to enter into a theater of performance for the international world, right? 
put on this show in Berlin or in Berlin and Berlin of look at how peaceful we are while we're getting killed and tortured, right? Look at all of these people marching peacefully while, you know, it's a theater for, for Western consumption, for international consumption, which is a form of self-sacrifice and a form of binding the Palestinians, of, making, of, of reinforcing their impotence in the face of Zionist violence. And it's all been pathologized, right? The Palestinian condition as a result is pathologized. It's they're not getting along because no, we're not getting along because of Palestinian violence, because there's a need to appease um, for benefit the colonizer, right? That's why we're not united. It's because of, of the violence. Um, and, and nothing's changed, right? The Zionist violence has escalated. The same tactics that we saw inklings of, and I, this movie is, is brilliant in its capacity to address pretty much every issue um, that the Palestinians endure, right? This constant humiliation, all the layers of humiliation, which I call it humiliation as a form of torture, and, and really that's what it is, right? Meant to really break you physically, psychologically, emotionally. All of these are, con they've been escalated, they've been perfected, they're now perfected means of humiliation of torture. Murder has been perfected, right? So none, nothing that they've done has changed. We've changed. Internationally, we've changed. The way Palestinians relate to it and deal with it has changed. And it's changed for the worse. And as a result, what we have is most of Palestine is gone. We saw in the past few weeks an escalation of land thefts, thefts an escalation of Palestinian murder. And our children are going to die at the gates of Jerusalem and at these torture points, which, you know, torture points which people call checkpoints, right? Um, meanwhile, Gaza is under a medieval siege. They're under a medieval siege while their shore is being pillaged for gas worth trillions of dollars that's being stolen and given away for profit by the Zionist colonizer. Um, but the children, you know, the youth, well, not just the youth, but pretty much, you know, everybody's done. You know, they've all said that what, what they're doing is an abject rejection, not only of Oslo, right, in their refusal to even coordinate any of their resistance efforts and doing it individually, but also a rejection of all of the attendant uh, institutions that came with Oslo, specifically the Palestinian Authority. Right. And this for them, and that's why we are here talking about centralizing, colonizing violence, because our people in Palestine, from whom we've always taken our leadership, are doing specifically that now. They are treating the issue of Palestine in a way that centers colonialism. Right? They're not talking about Oslo. They're attacking on all levels, indifferent to all of the institutions that Oslo ha has come up. So the other reason that we have devised this series is because there's been a huge gap between the conditions in Palestine and this beautiful, blossoming, mushrooming international solidarity movement. And I think one of the reasons for that huge gap is that there's been a, a disconnection between us and, and, and our movements and the Palestinian resistance, which has been muted for a long time, right? And the question for us tonight, for those of you who are gonna stay, and for those of you who are gonna work on the issue of Palestine, is how do we pivot our work to include uh, new projects, new ideas, which we'll discuss very briefly, to include us, or, or to have us become an extension of the Palestinian resistance in the ways that we are capable of being an extension of the Palestinian resistance to colonizing violence. And that's that's pretty much, you know, uh, again, uh, Brahim said that history repeats itself. At the Battle of Algiers, which will be our next event in the flyers. Even before the Algerian revolution, you know, this film ended, I don't know if anybody here has seen the Battle of Algiers, this film ended with uh, the Zaharit, you know, and, and the people coming out, but they were, it's so powerful, the juxtaposition, the contrast between this film and the Battle of Algiers. So it ended with Zaharit, but these were Zaharit of sorrow and, and calling on the community to go look for the, the, their murdered loved ones. The Battle of Algiers ends with Zaharit and the community coming together, dancing because they had defeated French colonialism in the U.S. Well, even before that happened, well, even before that happened, people were, were cheering the Algerian resistance movement, right? 
be, even because it was violent, right? Internationally cheering the Algerian liberation movement globally, the masses, not the government, right? And why is it that we are not thinking about ways to sanctify Palestinian resistance? Because how can we talk about self-determination if we're not saying that first and foremost, these people must be able to defend themselves, right? How can you talk about your future if you cannot protect your physical body? How? Can we sanctify the Palestinian resistance and get the movement back to the point where we were in the last stage of the Algerian liberation movement and have our people, our neighbors, our families cheering the Palestinian resistance the same way that they cheered the, the Algerian resistance 40, 50, I don't know, 60 years, I can't count, my mouth is horrible, 60 years ago. And so we're going to break out into sessions, but this is what, what we'd like to talk actually just really quickly about the sessions. So the Palestinian decolonization, cultural, you know, decolonizing cultural committee or preservation committee committee, whatever you, you want to call it, it and, and the Palestinian Sanctuaries Committee are two committees that came out of our last event and our last meeting. So for those who want to stay tonight, we can, we're can we going to have a Q&A session for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'd really encourage people who want to you know, be active, not necessarily with our organization or any organization, but might just want to be active on these projects, right? Um, Pal Palestinian sanctuaries, just briefly, what do I mean by that? You know, we talk about like an Israeli free zone or, you know, a pro BDS zone, but we, we don't talk about how all of these things really affect Palestinians in the myriad ways because the, the first and most hard hit by all of this legislation and these attacks are always the Palestinians. So deconstructing what it means to have Palestinian sanctuaries, where Palestinians are not just made safe, but they are actively protected. Once you actively protect Palestinians, well, then you're naturally anti-BDS, but you're, you're anti the terrorism laws, which criminalize Palestinian resistance. You're, you're against all of these other forms of Zionist violence. That is what a Palestinian sanctuary means. So that's the com those are the two committees that I'm hoping will break out, but we'll turn it over to you for question and answer about anything you'd like. Israel is not the only, and Zionism is not the only color Organizer and, and, and uh, source of violence in the area. The U.S. Uh, government, uh, the U.S. bourgeoisie, NATO, the U.N. Uh, are major sources of violence, and they have weaponized they have weaponized the Syrian revolution, and they have armed uh, mercenaries to go in and murder wholesale. Uh, Iraq is another place. The mass murder that took place in Egypt is another example. So I think it is a little tricky to just talk about Zionist violence without talking a little bit about who's responsible for creating the Zionists and Zionist violence, beginning with England, the UN, America, and so on. And so I want to correct something about Oslo. The whole problem started with the Camp David movement. And when you talk about national unity on one side, and then you talk about the exploiting classes that are within the nation on the other side, you have a huge contradiction. So maybe national unity is not the big deal we really should be looking for. We should be looking for the unity of very strong left resistance for self-defense, for, uh, for, for, but there is also something that has to be clarified here as we proceed to, to work here tonight into groups, is that what we are able to do here successfully has to be what is called peaceful resistance. You know, what, what, what we are organizing though we recognize that the Palestinians have a right to bear arms and to defend themselves. I thought the film was amazing, and I would love to see a wide release of it. I had a very emotional reaction to it, um, and I wanted to just sort of bring in two, two points on that and see if you had anything more to say. Um, from what I know, sort of as a learned person trying to study what's going on in the region, I know that Oslo also represented um, that, well, Zionist violence is manifested throughout the Arab world. And Oslo also represented a period of time that um, was used to sort of kill the last bastions of, of anti-normalization, sort of um, 
movements that existed in other Arab countries, and it also opened, it, it also um, sort of it opened the entire Middle East market um, to the hands of the West and the financial institutions. And when I when I was looking at that, I, was, I recalled reading about an incident where hundreds of farmers in Egypt were slaughtered at the hands of the Egyptian security um, sometime like a decade ago um, because of the um, loss of land that they were facing, the displacement that they were facing as a result of agricultural policies that came about as a result of opening up the region's market um, to these Western institutions, financial institutions and to Western governments um, that was facilitated also through Oslo. And I think that that's just one example. And I think we need to sort of be able to sort of talk um, in the Arab world as a whole as to how the Zionist and imperial violence um, has affected also their um, existence, you know, and their quality of life in, in, on, on all levels. And it's really warming to see protests um, of BDS happening in places like Egypt and in Jordan and, and Palestine continues to, to be a uniting factor. And just sort of the emotional response. You know, my, my father is 82 years old. He was born before the State of Israel was created. And he still talks about the days as a boy in Jordan um, giving up his lunch money so that he and his friends could buy the newspaper to hear what was happening at the front in Algeria. And to him, you know, recalling those stories is, is a little light of hope in a period of time when um, the manifestations, the long-term manifestations of colonialism are killing us and killing unity in our region. And so any thoughts on how we can begin to even talk about that again? Well, I found the film very moving also, and the discussion of Algeria very interesting and illuminating. It's certainly the case that we uh, that Palestine is a case of subtler colonialism, although I think it has more to do, I mean, it's an extreme case in the sense that Nazi Germany was subtler colonialism. There were plans to settle Germans in the East and exploit the region economically. That got submerged in the race war against the Soviet Union, against Judeo-Bolshevism, which led to the, the Holocaust. I mean, it was a very degenerate, extreme form, and that's what we're approaching. Uh, in the Middle East, I think. It's true that uh, Zionism has some relation to U.S. and before that British imperial interests, but we have to recognize that we are colonized here also, as the British were for that matter. I mean, there was a Zionist lobby, a very powerful Zionist lobby in England, and that's why the Balfour Declaration happened. They were constantly lobbying over a period of some years. The, uh, the uprising in 1929, uh, caused a reversal of British policy, and that was in turn reversed by the Zionist lobby. In this country, the Zionists basically took over uh, Middle East policy in the 1940s. Zionism was anathema to the military and diplomatic establishments. They were interested in Arab oil and in basing rights and, and air rights. Zionism worked against all of this, and the um, there's this big debate about strategic asset versus Israel lobby in U.S. foreign policy. Which is it? Well, the case of the 40s shows pretty clearly uh, that the Israel lobby is a quasi-sovereign force. And they overcame the military and diplomatic establishments of the U.S. government, and they forced U.S. support for partition and patronage of a Jewish state. That's the start of it in this country. And it's been going, going on ever since. I mean, to uh, get to the point of our current policy. I mean, the whole dissolution of the Middle East that has gone on since the end of the Cold War and the, the absence of any uh, you know, international rival is a Zionist agenda. I mean, the Zionists were, were plotting against Iraq and against Syria in the 70s. Uh, there was the well-known raid on the Iraqi reactor in 1981 or 82. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz, the lead neocon in the government, was writing studies about uh, Saddam Hussein in the late 70s at the Defense Department. Uh, there's the famous translation, which we all know of, Oded Yunan's article about the dissolution of the Middle East that came out in 1982. Israel Shahak translated it. I mean, the whole dissolution is, is a Zionist uh, idea. The Zionists were a key influence 
in the war vote in, in, eight, in 1990 against Iraq. They were a key influence in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. The 9-11 attacks um, were fundamentally against U.S. patronage of Israel. So we cannot overlook this, this overwhelming quasi-sovereign Zionist influence in this country in the form of what's called the Israel lobby. Pardon? Yeah, just start yeah. to wrap up so we can get a few more questions. Thank you. Uh, that, that really sums it up. We have to pay attention to the forces that are at work in this country, chiefly the Israel lobby, which is also the source of our animus against Syria and against Iran, the main source. So just I want to work with everybody as far as um, how we stop <clears throat> American imperialism. Because really American imperial imperialism and Israeli imperialism is really kind of like working together. So we have to stop those things. And that's really it. If we only look at it sort of through state actors, then that distorts our, our yes. vision. I, 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 so I, I agree with you that there is something else, another process, parallel process that's, uh, that's going on there. And in terms of talking about what can be done here, uh, I think if I understand correctly what Lemise was saying, then th this happened in the 50s with the French intelligentsia and the so-called progressives, where uh, the Algerian sort of revolution has, has, put them, uh, has put them in a state of panic uh, because of the tactics, because of, it was an, an, uh, an armed resistance, where uh, they found themselves, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, in a position condemning the, the acts of violence of the resistance, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, so they, in a way, they ended up sort of mistaking the trees for the forest, uh, as opposed to seeing it at the time, at least, uh, that it was a reaction to a, an inherently violent colonial uh, order. Uh, then it's more about blaming the victim yes. than uh, than looking at the uh, what the perpetrator yes. the perpetrator has done. So I think if I understand, that's uh, that's. Thank uh, you. Uh, but um, yeah. Okay. So thank you everybody for coming. If you want to stay around and join the work groups, uh, stick around. That's what we'll be doing next. For not too long, but just to kind of initiate and get the ball rolling to build from what was suggested at the last event. So we have more events coming up after the holiday season at aldanewyork.org uh, and follow us on our Facebook and have hot chocolate, buy shirts, eat popcorn. <laughs> thank you.